Okay, so uh, in the previous lecture, we introduced the uh, spatial tensor product or the minimal tensor product of C star algebras. Uh, so let's recall the, the construction. Uh, suppose we have two C star algebras A and B. And consider their uh, universal representations. So we denote by omega A the universal representation of A. And uh, omega B is the universal representation of B. Uh, so we can form their uh, tensor product omega A tensor omega B, uh, which is a representation of the algebraic tensor product of A and B on the Hilbert tensor product of the spaces HA and HB. Uh, and this representation is faithful uh, because of the tensor product of two faithful representations is also faithful. Uh, so we can now uh, introduce uh, a C star norm on the tensor product uh, by taking the restriction of the operator norm uh, defined on this algebra uh, to, the, to the tensor product. So for each element u in the algebraic tensor product of A and B, we define the spatial C star norm of u by the following equality. So this is just the operator norm uh, on uh, the tensor product of HA and HB. Uh, so the tensor product becomes uh, a pre c star algebra. So this is a star algebra equipped with a c star norm. And we define the spatial uh, tensor product of A and B to be the completion. Of uh, the algebraic tensor product with respect to the spatial C star norm. And this is a C star algebra. Uh, this algebra is also often called uh, the minimal C star tensor product and uh, is denoted like this. And the norm is also denoted in a similar way. And the reason for that is um, uh, Ethereum uh, due to Takesaki which we didn't prove because it is quite technical and which states that uh, this norm, the spatial norm is in fact the smallest possible C star norm on the algebraic tensor product. Okay, so this is the definition. It is uh, rather short, but it has at least two serious uh, disadvantages. First, it looks non-functorial and second, it looks uncomputable. Uh, and at the end of the previous lecture, we already uh, proved that in fact, uh, this construction is functorial. And to do this, to prove that it is functorial, we gave another equivalent formula for the spatial C star norm. Namely, we proved that, we proved the following theorem, uh, the spatial C star norm is the supremum Uh, of the norms of the following operators uh, where pi and tau run over the families of all star representations of A and B respectively. So here pi is a star representation of A and tau is a star representation of B. Uh, so this uh, equivalent formula for the uh, spatial C star norm uh, has the advantage of being functorial. So by using this theorem, we proved uh, the following corollary. If we have two star homomorphisms between C star algebras, say phi from A1 to B1 and psi from A2 to B2, star homomorphisms, 
then there exists a unique star homomorphism between their spatial C star tensor products. So this homomorphism is denoted in the following way. And actually it's just uh, the extension by continuity uh, of the usual algebraic tensor product of phi and psi. So it is uniquely determined uh, by the following condition. So this is, uh, in other words, this means that the uh, spatial C-star tensor product is a functor of two variables on the category of C-star algebras. Okay, um, so uh, we see that this uh, equivalent uh, formula for the uh, spatial, spatial C-star norm is functorial. But unfortunately, it is un still uncomputable. And uh, in some sense, it is even more uncomputable as uh, compared to the, our original formula. Uh, because this new formula involves all star representations of A and B, which are usually impossible to describe in reasonable terms. So our first goal for today is to give a computable definition. So we have the following result. Suppose that we have an arbitrary pair of faithful representations of A and B. So suppose that pi is a faithful star representation of A and the tau is a faithful star representation of B. Then I claim that uh, the spatial C star norm of any element in the algebraic tensor product it's just the operator norm of pi tensor tau of u. So in other words, if we compare this with our uh, original definition for the spatial C star norm, we see that uh, here we took uh, universal representations of A and B and here we now we take arbitrary faithful representations of A and B, which is much more convenient because for many concrete sister algebras, we already have a faithful, a faithful representation, uh, which is different from the uh, universal representation. So this is very useful. Uh, to prove this uh, theorem, we need a lemma from classical functional analysis. Uh, so suppose that H is a Hilbert space and let uh, FD of H denote the family of all finite dimensional vector subspaces of H. And uh, for each finite dimensional subspace of H or each L, uh, we denote by PL the orthogonal projection, the orthogonal projection onto L. I claim that uh, for each uh, bounded linear operator T on the Hilbert tensor product of H and K, we have the following formula. The norm of T is the supremum the norms of the following operators, the L tensor one, where one is the identity map of K, T, P L tensor one. The supremum is taken over all finite dimensional subspaces of H. Okay, so let's prove the lemma. Uh, so we take uh, an operator T on the Hilbert tensor product. We take an arbitrary positive epsilon 
and we choose vector u, which can be chosen in the algebraic tensor product of h and k, such that the norm of u is one, and such that uh, the norm of t of u is almost the norm of t in the sense that, um, in the sense that, let me write this in the following way, in the sense that the norm of t is less than or equal to the norm of t of u plus epsilon. So this is always possible by the definition of the operator norm and by the density on the algebraic tensor product in the Hilbert tensor product. So u is uh, an element in the algebraic tensor product and we can write it as the following finite sum from one to n. Uh, let's now observe the following. We observe that for each element uh, v in the Hilbert tensor product of H and K, uh, we have the following convergence. PL tensor one applied to V converges to V where uh, we, uh, the convergence, this is the convergence of, of the respective net. So PL, uh, L runs over the family of all finite dimensional subspaces of H, which is uh, a partially ordered directed set. So the order relation is just the inclusion. Uh, and uh, this net converges to V for each V. Why is it so? Well, this is uh, indeed the case uh, because uh, this is obviously true for simple tensors. If we substitute a simple tensor here, then we get PL of V tensor Y. And if L is big enough, if L contains V, uh, if L contains X, sorry, then of course we have the exact identity. So these, these, uh, these two vectors are the same if L is big enough. So this is true for elementary tensors. Uh, and elementary tensors span a dense subspace of the Hilbert tensor product. And the net is bounded. This net is bounded, obviously, because the norm of the orthogonal projection is one. And we know, uh, we have already used this uh, classical fact that if we have a net of operators, uh, bounded net of operators, which converges uh, pointwise on a total subset, uh, then it converges pointwise everywhere. So this is exactly this case. So this implies that uh, we have uh, convergence, this convergence for each element V in the Hilbert tensor product. Okay, now, uh, mm, this implies that you can find a finite dimensional vector subspace L H such that first of all, it contains uh, X one to X N and such that um, the norm of T of U minus PL tensor one T of U is smaller than epsilon. So we just use the, the pointwise convergence on, uh, on this vector t of u. So now v is t of u. And we can, if we take l big enough, we can always assume that l contains x1 to xn. Okay, now we just, uh, we can now uh, estimate the norm of t. So the norm of T by assumption is less than or equal to the norm of T of U plus epsilon. Now the previous formula implies that this is less than or equal to the norm of PL tensor one of T of U plus two epsilon plus two epsilon. And finally we observe that this is the same as PL tensor one, T PL tensor one of U. Again, plus trip sun. Well, indeed, uh, X one to XL are contained in L and uh, therefore uh, this vector 
is nothing but u. And that's it. So we see that um, that uh, these two numbers, the norm of t and the norm of this operator are close to each other. And so this completes the proof. Okay, so this is our lemma. And now let's apply this lemma to, to our theorem. So let's recall that we want to show that uh, the uh, C star, um, the spatial C star norm of U is given by the following formula. In other words, we have to show that this right hand side of this equality doesn't depend on the choice of faithful representations. Because uh, in the original definition, we took the universal, represent universal representations, and here we took arbitrary faithful representations. So, in other words, we have to show the following. So, this is our proof. So, we take uh, a pair of faithful representations of A. So, let pi. and say um, pi prime uh, be faithful representations of A and similarly to and tau prime be faithful representations of B. Uh, so each uh, pair, uh, um, pi and tau, or pi prime and tau prime, determines a norm, a C star norm, on the uh, algebraic tensor product. By the following formula. So we want to show that this number doesn't depend on the choice of pi and two. In other words, we want to prove the following inequality. And in order to prove this equality, uh, we may assume from the very beginning that, um, for example, pi equals pi prime. Well, indeed, just uh, if we want to move from pi prime tau prime to pi tau, we first change pi prime. Uh, this is the first step. And then we change tau prime to tau. This is the second step. So if we show that the norm uh, doesn't change on each of the steps, then we are done. So for uh, convenience, we, we will show that the, the norm doesn't change when we change the second representation tau. OK, now. Uh, to prove that, uh, to prove this equality, uh, we do the following. We take an arbitrary finite dimensional subspace L of H, and we define a map by L from A to B of L by the following formula. Of course, I don't claim that this is an algebra homomorphism. In general, it is not an algebra homomorphism. Uh, in some sense, this means that we take the matrix in the matrix language that this means that if we take the matrix of pi away, then we um, take uh, a finite uh, upper left corner of this matrix. Okay, so now we are in, a, in BOL, which is finite dimensional, and this will help us a lot. Now we observe that um, we have the following equality. So if we substitute uh, our operator, this operator uh, in the previous lemma, so we 
take PL tensor one. Now I substitute here by tensor two of U. And again, multiply by PL tensor one. So this uh, equals the following. This is one tensor two applied to uh, phi L tensor one of U. So here, this is this is the um, uh, the identity map of B, and this is the identity map of B of L. This is um, almost obvious. We just to, to check this formula, we just substitute here an elementary tensor. If U is A tensor B, then both sides will be equal to uh, the test product of pi L. P of A pi L, that is uh, uh, this operator, and the toe of B. So, and since they are the same on elementary tensors, they are the same by linearity, they are the same on for each element U in the algebraic tensor product. Okay. Um, so now we have, let's look at the following picture. So we take the tensor product of B of L and B and B. So this is the algebra in which uh, in which uh, this element sits. And we have two representations of this algebra. The first one is uh, um, one tensor two and this uh, Representation acts to B of L tensor K. And the second one is uh, one tensor two prime, which acts to B of L tensor H to L tensor K prime. One tensor two prime. So both of them are obviously faithful star representations of this tensor product. I claim that we have the following equality for each element V in this tensor product of B of L and B. Uh, we can apply the first representation to V We can apply the second representation to V and the norms will be the same. Why are they the same? They're the same because uh, L is finite dimensional. And we know that, um, so B of L tensor B is nothing but the tensor product by the matrix algebra, MN. And we already know that there is a unique C star norm on this tensor product. And there is a unique C star norm. On this tensor product. So uh, this formula and the left-hand side of this formula and the right-hand side for all this formula determine uh, two sister norms on the tensor product and by uniqueness, they are equal to each other. Okay, now we uh, come back to our calculation. So we use our lemma and we see that uh, uh, the norm of uh, the norm U pi two. So this is the norm of, um, of this operator, pi tensor two of u. So by lemma, uh, this is equal to the norm, to the supremum of the norms of these operators, by lemma, or equivalent to the supremum of the norms of these operators. 
let's write this down. Uh, so this is the supremum over L. As before, L runs over all finite dimensional subspaces of H of uh, what, uh, let's look here, of this expression, one tensor two, one tensor two applied to phi tensor one of U. So this is true by our lemma and by the previous equality. Uh, and now we uh, can uh, replace tau by tau prime here because of this. Let's do it. So we replace uh, tau by tau prime. Supremum over all finite dimensional subspaces. One tensor tau prime phi tensor one of u. And applying our lemma again, we conclude that this is nothing but the norm of u uh, determined by pi and tau prime. And this completes the proof. So we have shown that these two norms are the same. Okay, so um, let's now apply our theorem uh, to showing that, um, to describing um, spatial C star tensor products of concrete, of concrete uh, C star algebras. So again, the advantage of this formula is that um, we can take arbitrary faithful representations and very often concrete C star algebras are already come with concrete faithful star representations. Uh, corollary one. Corollary one. Suppose that we have two C star subalgebras of say B of H and B of K. Two C star subalgebras. then their spatial C star tensor product is nothing but the closure of the algebraic tensor product in the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert tensor product of H and K. So here we have, we assume that this the algebraic tensor product is canonically embedded into the B of H tensor K, and after we take a closure, we take the we get the uh, spatial C star tensor product. In some sense, this corollary explains why the spatial C star tensor product is so cold. So it is determined by space by the spaces uh, H and K, and by uh, embeddings of A and B into the respective algebras of operators. Okay, um, let's now apply this corollary to to the following concrete example, corollary two. I claim that if we take two algebras of compact operators, K of H1 and K, K of H2, then their spatial C star tensor product is nothing but the algebra of compact operators on the Hilbert tensor product of H1 and H2. Uh, to prove this result, uh, let's recall some standard facts about uh, compact operators. So let's introduce, first of all, the following notation. Suppose that H is a Hilbert space and X and Y are two vectors in H. So we denote by the following symbol, x uh, circle y, the operator on H given by the following formula. It takes each element z 
to the following element of H. So this is uh, a bounded rank one operator. Its image is one dimensional. Its image is spanned by X. Uh, if you now take the linear span of all operators of this form, so here X and Y run over H, then what we get is nothing but the uh, space of all bounded finite rank operators. That is bounded operators with finite dimensional image. This is simple exercise. So each bounded finite rank operators can be written as a finite sum of such operators of the form X circle Y. And it's the standard fact of functional analysis that uh, this space of bounded finite rank operators is dense in the algebra of compact operators. This is dense in K of H. This is a standard fact of functional analysis. Okay, now we can prove uh, our corollary. Proof of corollary two. Uh, by corollary one, um, the uh, spatial tensor product of K of H1 and K of H2 equals the closure of the algebraic tensor product of k of h1 and uh, k of h2. So the closure is taken in the algebra of bounded operators on the tensor product. Uh, we now use the above fact, and by using this fact, we can replace in this formula uh, the compact operators by bounded finite rank operators because they are dense and we already have the closure here. So we continue this equality as follows. So this is the algebra of bounded finite rank operators on H1. We take also the algebra of bounded finite rank, finite rank operators on H2. We take the tensor product and we take the again the closure in the algebra of bounded operators. Okay, now uh, let's write this in a different way. Uh, it's easy to see that uh, if you take uh, the tensor product of this operator and this rank one operator, then the result will be the respective rank one operator corresponding to elementary tensors x1 tensor y1 and y, oh sorry, x1 tensor x2 and y1 tensor y2. Uh, oh no, sorry, x1 and x x1 and y1 are in h1 and x2 uh, h1 and uh, x2 y2 in h2. Okay, and finally, uh, let's observe that um, all elements of this form, x1 tensor x2, uh, they span a dense subspace in H1, uh, in H1 tensor H2, in the Hilbert tensor product. And the same is true for the second element. So these elements also span a dense subspace in H1 tensor H2. So because we have, we take the closure here, we can replace uh, this elementary tensor by an arbitrary element in the tensor product. So xi and eta, or xi and eta run over the Hilbert tensor product.
Okay, and now we apply um, apply the bar effect again. Uh, so we apply the density of this subspace in K of H. We apply it to, to the tensor product, and we conclude that this closure is nothing but the algebra of compact operators on the tensor product H1 tensor H2. And this completes the proof. So the tensor product of two algebras, the spatial C-star tensor product of two algebras of compact operators is again the algebra of compact operators on the tensor product. Uh, here is a useful exercise. Actually, this is um, a question which was asked, asked by Vladislav at the previous lecture. So I, now I ask the same, essentially the same question to you. Uh, so let's take two algebras of bounded operators, B of H1 and B of H2. So uh, the previous, our previous results imply that we have an isometric embedding of this algebra into the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert tensor product. This is an isometric embedding. So the question is, is it subjective? Or in other words, if you take the algebraic tensor product of B of H1 and B of H2, uh, is it dense in the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert tensor product? Well, this is useful exercise. Okay, our next goal will be to um, describe the uh, special sister tensor product of an arbitrary sister algebra by a commutative sister algebra. Uh, first of all, let's introduce some notation. Suppose that X is a locally compact Hausdorff topological space. And suppose that E is a Banach space. We denote by C0 of xy the space of those continuous maps from, F, from, from x to E, which vanish at infinity in the sense that their norm, the function which takes the function which takes f to the norm of f of x vanishes at infinity. Which means that for each positive epsilon, there is a compact subset k of x such that the norm of f of x is less than epsilon outside k. Uh, we have the following uh, useful exercise. First of all, I claim that C0 of, of xA is a Banach space. This is a Banach space uh, with respect to the uniform norm, to the supremum norm. The proof was exactly the same as in the case where, where we have, uh, where we have uh, functions with values in the base field, in the field of complex numbers. Exercise two, suppose now that A is a C star algebra, then uh, the space C0 of XA is also a C star algebra. With respect to the same norm and with respect to the involution determined point wise. So f star of x is f of x star. Oh, this is also elementary. And finally, exercise three. Again, for each bond of space E, we consider we can consider the following map from the algebraic tensor product of C of X and E, C0 of X and E, 
to C0 of Xe. So this map is uniquely determined by the following formula. If F is F tensor V is an elementary tensor, uh, well, let's denote this map by phi, phi. And uh, this map takes each elementary tensor, uh, F tensor V, to the function given by the following formula. So the exercise is to show that this map has dense image. <clears throat> well, maybe this is not entirely trivial, so I'll give a hint. The hint is to use partitions of unity. Okay, now we have the following theorem. Suppose that X is a locally compact Hausdorff topological space. And suppose that A is a C star algebra. Then there exists an isometric star isomorphism an isometric star isomorphism phi from the uh, spatial tensor product of C0 of X and A to the algebra C0 of X A Uh, uniquely determined by the following equality. So this isomorphism takes each elementary tensor, F tensor A, uh, to, the, to the function given by the following formula. So in other, in other words, if we look at the previous exercise, so this is actually the map from part three of the previous exercise, which is defined on a dense, um, which is defined on the algebraic tensor product. So our theorem states that if we uh, have an arbitrary C star algebra A, then this map uniquely extends from the algebraic tensor product to an isomorphism between the spatial C star tensor product of these algebras and the algebra C0 of Xa. Okay, to prove this theorem, we do the following. We choose an arbitrary faithful star representation of A, pi. arbitrary faithful star representation. And we take uh, a concrete uh, faithful star representation of C0 of X, we denote it by M. So this is the representation of C0 of X on uh, the space little L2 of X, which consists of all square summable families of complex numbers indexed by X. And this uh, operator, uh, this map M, takes uh, each function F to the multiplication operator MF. So MF of G is the pointwise product of F and G. So it's easy to see that M is a faithful star representation of C0 of X. So 
Okay. Um, so let's now look at the following commutative diagram. So we can form the um, algebraic tensor product of C0 of X and A. And we form the uh, tensor product of these two representations, M and pi. And this will be the representation of this algebra on the Hilbert tensor product of a little L to all X and H. So by our previous theorem, this uh, representation will be isometric if we equip the algebraic tensor product with the spatial C star norm. <clears throat> now we can co complete this picture as follows. So first I uh, draw the ingredients and then I explain them. So this is phi, which acts from this tensor product to C0 of XA. So this is precisely the map phi, which is, was defined in the previous exercise. And we already know that it has dense image. Um, here we have a unitary, uh, an isometric star isomorphism induced by a certain unitary isomorphism between the Hilbert tensor product of these spaces and the space of uh, a little L2 of XH of all square summable families of elements in H indexed by X. And here we have uh, another representation which will be denoted by M pi. So let, let me explain these arrows. So we already know, um, we already know about this arrow and about, about this arrow. So what is AD of U? First of all, uh, U is a standard unitary isomorphism between uh, the tensor product and uh, a little L2 of, of XH. And this isomorphism is uniquely determined by the following formula. If G is a element of a little L2 and H is an element in H, then the resulting function is given by the following formula. And this is a unitary isomorphism. Actually, the fact that this is a unitary isomorphism was an exercise uh, from one of the previous lectures. Okay, and AD of U is a star isomorphism induced by U. AD of U is defined as follows. So it is an isometric star isomorphism. Finally, I have to explain what M pi is. M pi is given by the following formula. <clears throat> uh, well, um, if F is a function from X to A, it is a C zero function from X to A, then M pi of F uh, should be an operator acting off on the little L2 space. So we have to reply to little g, which is g is an element of little l2 of xh. Uh, the result should be again um, in l2 of xh. So, and its value at x uh, is the following. We first take f of x. f of x will be an element in a. Then we apply pi. And this will be an operator on h. And we act by this operator on the vector g of x. G is uh, in the little auto space. So this is MPI. <clears throat> it's uh, a very simple exercise to show that MPI is also a faithful star representation. So it's a faithful star representation, hence it is also isometric. And the diagram is commutative.
this is also straightforward. So now we see that in the diagram we have a, a, an isometric star homomorphism M tensor pi, which is isometric with respect to the spatial C star norm here. Phi is, well, we know, we, know, we know nothing about phi, but we know that M pi is an isometry and a G of U is an isometric star isomorphism. So this diagram implies that phi is also isometric. If we equip the algebraic tensor product with a spatial C star norm, then phi becomes isometric. This is an isometric star homomorphism with dense image. The density of the image is uh, our previous exercise. And since C0 of X of A is a Banach space, this implies that after we extend phi to the completion, we get an isometric star isomorphism. Phi extends to an isometric star isomorphism between the uh, spatial tensor product of C0 of X and A and the algebra C0 of X A. And this completes the proof. Uh, here is a useful corollary. Suppose that we have two locally compact Hausdorff topological spaces, X and Y. Then uh, there exists an isometric star isomorphism. between the spatial C star tensor product of C0 of X and C0 of Y and the algebra of the algebra C0 on their product X and Y. And this isomorphism takes each elementary tensor, say F tensor G, to the function uh, uh, given by the following formula. So to prove this corollary, we apply our previous theorem. to uh, the algebra C0 of Y. So we substitute C0 of Y in the previous theorem and use following isomorphism, use the isomorphism between uh, C0 from X to C0 of Y and the algebra C0 on their product. And it's a little, a little exercise to show, to prove this isomorphism. So we, when we combine our theorem with this isomorphism, we get uh, the result. This is a little exercise in general topology. Okay. Okay, so so far we discussed the uh, spatial or the minimal C-star tensor product. Our next goal will be to discuss briefly another C-star tensor product, namely the maximal tensor product of C-star algebras.
Okay, so again, suppose that we have two C-star algebras, A and B. And let's recall once again, one of the definitions of their uh, spatial C-star tensor product. So if U is an element in the algebraic tensor product, then the spatial or the minimal C-star norm is given by the following supremum. Pi one tensor pi two of U where pi one is a star representation of A and pi two is a star representation of B. We now define another C star norm on the tensor product as follows. The maximal C star tensor norm is again a supremum uh, taken over all representations of the algebraic tensor product. Your price runs over the family of all star representations of the algebraic tensor product. So what is clear from this definition is that the minimal C-star norm is less than or equal to the maximal C-star norm. For the simple reason that here we have, here we consider all representations of, on the algebraic tensor product. And here we consider only uh, some of them which can be decomposed is as tensor product of uh, representations of A and B respectively. But what is not clear from this definition is that the maximal C star norm is actually finite. Clearly it is not negative, but hypothetically it can be equal to infinity. Of course, uh, this, is, this will be not very useful if it is infinite. So the natural question is, why is it finite? Uh, to answer this question, let's introduce some notation. Suppose that we have three algebras, just algebras, not sister algebras, but just algebras A and B and C. And two algebra homomorphisms. Phi is a homomorphism from A to B to C, from A to C, and psi is a homomorphism from, from B to C. Two algebra homomorphisms. Uh, we define a linear map uh, phi cross psi from the tensor product of A and B to C by the following formula. So we define it on elementary tensors, but uh, by the universal property of the algebraic tensor product, it uniquely extends to the algebraic tensor product of A and B. So this is a linear operator, a linear map from the tensor product to C. Of course, I don't claim that it is always an algebra homomorphism. So we introduce the following, we give the following definition. We say that phi and psi commute and symbolically write the following. If uh, phi of A and psi of B commute for all elements A and B. for all A and B. Well, we have the following simple proposition. So suppose that phi and psi commute for 
then in this case, the map phi cross psi is an algebra homomorphism. And uh, if uh, A, B, and C are star algebras, if A, B, and C are star algebras, and phi and psi are star homomorphisms, uh, then uh, phi cross psi is also a star homomorphism. The proof is straightforward, so this is an exercise for you. Uh, it's also rather easy to see that if uh, we assume that the algebras A and B are unital, then this construction can be reversed. So we have the following observation. Uh, let's start with an algebra homomorphism from the tensor product. So suppose that pi is an algebra homomorphism from the tensor product of A and B to C. Suppose this is an algebra homomorphism. And suppose that A and B are unital. In this case, when we can define a pair of homomorphism from A to C and from B to C, we define phi from A to C and psi from B to C uh, as follows. Phi away is pi applied to A tensor one and psi of B is pi applied to one tensor B. And then it's almost immediate that phi and psi are algebra homomorphisms. Uh, they commute. And pi equals phi cross psi. So we see that if A and B are unital, then each uh, star, each homomorphism from the tensor pro to C comes from a pair of commuting homomorphisms from A to C and from B to C. It turns out that um, uh, this observation can be extended to arbitrary that is not necessarily unital A and B, provided that A and B are C star algebras and C is uh, the algebra of bounded operators on the Hilbert space. In other words, we have the following theorem. Suppose that A and B are C star algebras. And suppose that pi is a non-degenerate star representation of their tensor product. Non-degenerate star representation. Then there is a unique pair a unique pair pi A and pi B of non-degenerate star representations of A and B respectively, such that they commute and such that pi is pi A cross pi B. Well, uh, if you don't mind, I, I'll skip the proof. It is not uh, hard, but it's a bit um, technical. And instead, let's look uh, how to use this theorem. So we come back to the sister tensor product, to the maximal sister tensor product. And we get uh, the following result. So again, suppose that A and B are C star algebras. 
then, first of all, I claim that uh, the maximal C star norm is finite. So it is indeed a C star norm on the tensor product. All other axioms of a C star norm are immediate. What is not immediate is that it is finite. Uh, second, I claim that for each uh, C star algebra C, and for each star homomorphism, for each star homomorphism, phi uh, from the algebraic tensor product of A and B to C, uh, the following inequality holds the norm of phi of U is less than or equal to the maximal C star norm of U. Part three, uh, which explains why the maximal C star norm is so cold, I claim that this is the largest C star norm. On the tensor product. On the algebraic tensor product. And finally, part four, the maximal C star norm is a cross norm in the sense that the following equality holds. Okay, let's now prove this. First of all, why is it finite? So uh, actually we have to show the following. We want to show that for each element u in you know, the algebraic tensor product, there is a constant, a positive constant c, which in general depends on u, such that the norm of pi of u is less than or equal to c for each star representation pi of the algebraic tensor product. So the existence of such a constant means precisely that the maximal C star norm is finite. Okay, um, so to prove this, we may assume from the very beginning that pi is not degenerate. Because we already know that each non each uh, star representation is a direct sum of a non-degenerate representation and the zero representation. Uh, now the previous theorem implies that in this case, uh, pi comes from a pair of, of a commuting pair of representations of A and B respectively. This follows from the previous theorem. Uh, let's now take our element u and let's write it as a finite sum of elementary tensors ai tensor bi. Then uh, we can estimate pi of u as follows. So since pi is pi a cross pi b, this will be the sum of pi a of ai uh, pi b of bi. And now we use uh, the triangle inequality and the fact that pi a and pi b are contractive. So that is the norm of pi a and pi b is one. So this can be estimated as the following sum. 
And this is our constant. It doesn't depend on, on pi. Okay, so this completes the proof of part one. Uh, and now to prove part two, we observe that part two is clear from the definition of the maximal C star norm, provided that C is the algebra of bounded operators on a Hilbert space. So part two is clear if B, if, if C is the algebra of bounded operators on some Hilbert space H. This falls from the definition. And in the general case, we simply apply the second Gilfand Nymark theorem. to the algebra C. So C is isometrically embedded in B of H and everything is reduced to the case where C is exactly B of H. Okay, part three, we want to show that the maximal C star norm is indeed the largest C star norm on the algebraic tensor product. Okay, let's now take an arbitrary C star norm. Suppose that we have a C star norm on the tensor product. And let's just apply part two to the um, embedding of, um, well, let's um, introduce some notation for the completion. So let's see, uh, denote the completion the completion of the algebraic tensor product with respect to this norm. And now to prove part three, we apply part two to the inclusion of A tensor B to C. So by part two, uh, this um, map uh, doesn't uh, increase uh, the norm if we equip A tensor B with the maximal C star norm. But this means exactly that this arbitrary C star norm is less than or equal to the maximal C star norm. Okay, and finally part four, we want to show that the maximal C star norm is a cross norm in the sense that this equality holds. Again, uh, to prove this, we take an arbitrary non degenerate star representation. a non-degenerate star representation of the tensor product. Uh, we apply pi to a tensor b. So we know from the previous theorem that pi is pi a cross pi b. So this will be pi of a, pi of b. Uh, and the norm of this is less than or equal to the product of the norm of A and the norm of B. So when we take the supremum over all non degenerate star representations, we see that the left hand side will be nothing but the maximal C star norm of this elementary tensor. And the right hand side doesn't depend on pi. So this is less than or equal to the product of the norm of A and the norm of B. But we already know that the spatial C star norm is a cross norm. So this is equal to the spatial C star norm of A and B, of A tensor B. And by the previous part, this is less than or equal to the maximal C star norm. So this chain of inequalities actually shows that all of them are equalities and this completes the proof. So the maximal C star norm is indeed a C star norm. So we can take the completion and we naturally come to the following definition. The maximal tensor product, maximal C star tensor product of 
of A and B is uh, the completion of the algebraic tensor product with respect to the maximal C star norm. And we use the following notation for the maximal C star tensor product. Uh -huh. Okay, I see that it's time to finish. Uh, well, uh, at the beginning of the next lecture, we discuss some uh, elementary, uh, so some properties of the maximal uh, C star tensor product, which follow from uh, its from the previous theorem, uh, and we compare uh, the maximal and the minimal C star tensor products. Uh, in particular, we will discuss um, a useful uh, class of algebras for which the maximal and the minimal C star products are the same. And these are the so-called nuclear C star algebras. In particular, we will show that uh, the algebra of compact operators on an arbitrary Hilbert space is nuclear. And after that, we uh, eventually come to compact quantum groups. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you.